Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? Today, we're going to talk about my education and how that kept me from teaching women's history. And then we're going to talk about nuns. (laughs) I love nuns. (laughs) Me too. I'm not sure why, but they're just very nice people. (laughs) Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50% the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Episode 16, My Education and Nuns. To be clear, the title makes it sound like I was educated by nuns, and I was not. <laughs> I went to public school. Oh, good to know. Yeah. I did as well, so, so there you we're not it. up on our nuns. Yeah, some people joke about nuns. I guess they're, like, pretty harsh educators. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know anything about it. I should have gone and done a little more research on that. Yeah, I guess I'm not really familiar either. To our listeners, if you were raised <laughs> in a Catholic school, we'd love to know more. Yeah. We're going to talk today, though, about my education as a history teacher, because I think that this is really informative in why women are left out of history class. Okay. Um, so... My education, probably very similar to yours. Yeah. So where did you go? Went to public school here in New Hampshire. And you went to public school. I did as well in Connecticut. I took all the normal things that most people take, right? Like government, (laughs) economics. We did a stock market project. That was cool. Yep. Um, Sounds familiar. U.S. history, right? I think there was a world history in there. Um... The school offered psychology. I didn't take it. Oh, I took psychology. You did? And philosophy. Both really fun. You're very cool. Um, in that entire education, I don't recall, and granted, I teach high schoolers. I know how terrible they are at recalling things that I know <laughs> that I've taught them. <laughs> yeah, but you also live in that headspace every day where you're more you're very close to the topics that you would have interacted with. Yeah. You know, like I think about other teachers and, and even when I thought about going into education myself, I could re- start recalling memories that I hadn't really thought about because yeah. I was in a school building. I was in a situation that was similar to what I was in in high school. Whereas now that I'm not in that environment anymore, I, it would be really hard to recall memory. Yeah. I don't remember learning any women's history. And not even topics that, like, you should teach, like the 19th Amendment. Like, none. You didn't do, like, Salem witch trials. Don't have any memory of it. Interesting. Or, like, any of the women's right movement. No, but I do remember the Battle of Lexington and Concord being sketched on the chalkboard. Like, that's how deep... My my teacher, my high school teacher, understood this battle. So then I go off to college. I decide, um, based on a um, political science class that I took, that I wanted to be a political science major. And I thought, okay. that's really cool. Poli sci and history are brothers and sisters. They, yeah, they, they usually, just go hand in hand. But the, And whenever someone's like, oh, I was a political science major, I usually start to distance myself a little bit. Yeah, because we like to talk <laughs> politics. Sorry. Not even like to talk politics. You're like, so, let me get into it. And you're like, I just want to drink a drink and talk about pumpkin carving. Can yeah. Not right now. <laughs> so I decided to be a poli sci major, and I am taking all these classes. Like, the first paper that I had to write as a poli sci major was a history paper. Um, oh, interesting. This was, I mean, I talk about this with my students. My first college paper that I had to write was a 15-page paper, and oh. the assignment was pick a president, pick a policy, and, like, talk about the history of that policy that that president Who passed. did you pick? So I picked uh, Jimmy Carter, and I picked him because I'd never heard of him in my history class. <laughs> history ended you never at, heard of Jimmy Carter? History ended at World War II. Whoa. Right? In high school. So I feel like I had a teacher that was kind of obsessed with Jimmy Carter. So maybe I so they like went, about went big. who he was. Him yep. and Nixon. I felt like we lived in the Nixon era for like a long time. Okay. But this is my first okay. college class. And I also wanted to be a history minor. 
Um, and I got a minor in Asian studies and a minor in theater. Oh, By, excuse me. <laughs> I know, nerd alert. Well, theater, you know. Oh, uh, yes, the theater. <laughs> I knew you were a great thespian. <laughs> yes. So um, those things combined, I actually took a ton of history classes, but I was one class shy of a history minor, so oh, I don't Jesus. actually have that on my transcript if you look it up. I mean, go back. Ma'am. I don't think you can look it up, but <laughs> I took a lot of history classes, and those classes, I think, are case in point why when I became an educator, I had no idea about women's history. The first thing that I will say to this is every professor in the history department was male. The poli-sci department was made up of three people. One of them was female. In high school, college, and grad school, every single time I had the opportunity to research a woman, I took that opportunity. So I am not alone, I think, in doing that. I think people tend to choose research topics that are similar to, uh, to people that are similar to them or topics that are interesting or important to them or relatable for them. And so when you look at my professors, um, it is not surprising that they don't teach women's history because so few of them are women. I was a theater minor, and I had to take a course called the History of Theater in order to get my minor, and that class was actually taught by one of the theater, um, female theater department professors, and that one got me dual credit for history and, and theater. Um, so that was the only class that I took in my undergrad that was taught by a woman. My college did offer courses in women's studies, and I actually remember sitting in on one of the women's studies courses during the weekend that I came to visit my college. Um, but it's interesting because I didn't, I was not required um, to take a woman's history course in order to be, you know, a, a history minor or um, it was not a requirement for poli sci. Like you didn't have to study women in politics. You didn't have to study, you know, how women navigated the political arena. Um, I remember in one of my first poli sci courses, we had to debate whether or not Hillary Clinton could ever be elected president, not based on her politics, but based on her femaleness. And I was the, I mean, this is also another piece of the puzzle. I was the only girl in the poli sci major. And so in that particular class, it was me and 18 boys. So we chose our own sides, and it ended up being basically me and this guy, James. Shout out to James, by the way, probably the smartest person I know. Uh, not because he sided with me on this particular point, but um, he's really just the smartest person I know. <laughs> but anyway, James and I have to take on like the other 17 kids in class basing our entire argument over whether someone with a vagina can be president. It was the weirdest debate. Of course, all of this is happening, I think, prior to her even being senator of New York, prior to her being secretary of state. So really the only thing that we knew about Hillary Clinton was her time as first lady. And so the only thing that was substantive in this debate was the question of, you know, her femaleness, but particularly, like, should some someone with no military experience be the commander in chief? And I think that's a compelling question, but I, I don't know why we targeted a woman to discuss that compelling question because there have been many presidents who did not have military experience. Some of those presidents with no military experience led us to war. So, um, so of course, James and I were very quick to bring that up. It's also the only time that I really recall talking about women in poli-sci classes. And that's even, I had a poli-sci professor who I took multiple courses with, and in her classes, they were predominantly based on international relations, and they had a very, like, top-down viewpoint. So um, we did a lot of talking about, you know, big picture, zoom out, national interactions. We even had a female adjunct professor come in at one point. I took a class called Middle Eastern Politics with her, and in that class, I had to memorize all of the leaders of the Middle Eastern countries, which included like most of North Africa all the way to like India. And, um, you know, of course I'm just memorizing the names of men. So, you know, these, these 
sort of show that poli sci was no better than history because it was very top down. I took, um, I mean, the pick a president, pick a policy. Cool. So no women yeah. are going to be picked for that particular essay. One of the straight history classes that I took was a course on the American Revolution. We read four books that we were, we were assigned four books. I'm surprised you didn't hear about any women in that. I did hear about women. Okay. But the books that we were assigned as part of the mandatory readings were John Adams, mm. Thomas Jefferson, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. George Washington, Solid. Bed Franklin. I mean... All memorable characters. All memorable characters. Probably should be discussed. Yes, definitely. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, there were women there. Yep. And those books, I mean, these were like David McCullough type books. Yeah, these are big. Like super dense, high quality history. Of course he talks about women in those books. Um, John Adams, I remember, you know, all the stuff about Abigail Adams that I got from that book. Yep. I remember that Thomas Jefferson um, had children with one of his enslaved women. Yeah. And um, that she came back with him from his time in France. She came and she was willing to come over. So the details about the Sally Hemings, by the way, let's give her a name. Oh, sure. These women, I remember their stories, but they were sort of passing mention in the narratives, in in the literal texts that we are reading about these four prominent men. I took a class called The History of Islam, which um, that class actually did a great, I think, a better job of elevating the stories of women. I remember um, Fatima and um, other, you know, other major women in the the founding of Islam um, playing, you know, playing a really important role. Um, actually, the the text that we were reading was written by a female scholar, Karen Armstrong. Okay. So that was really cool. So, I mean, obviously our audience is probably listening to this feeling very similar. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm sitting here being like, yup, yup. I, these are some things I've learned. Others I have not. But also, you know, I think I sit back and I, and remember you know, what made an impact on me or where I felt like I belonged or who I saw leading. And I don't know that it was ever from necessarily women in in our classrooms, but it was women in the current media and outside of our classrooms. Yeah, absolutely. So the point here is I'm a person who's about to go on to become an educator, and I don't know anything about really no no depth on women in history i have passing mention in that's, in all that's these a classes little scary it's very scary i think that it is illustrative of how cyclical history education is i go to grad school and uh in grad school i was required to take a whole bunch of pedagogy classes and um, neuroscience and, you know, psychology, sociology, all things about more like the field of education and how to teach and that type of thing, because I was a social studies education. um, That's my master's is in that. And I did have to take some um, content-related classes. Um, Those, you know, social studies is incredibly broad. And so I took a course on economics. I took a course on civil rights history, the civil rights movement. But all of this should go to show that the teachers basically at the graduate level assumed that I already knew the history. Right. And... Probably, to their credit, probably do. I know that history, the history that I was taught, I know it really well, right? I was a right. great student. You know, I had to take exams to become an educator, and then you have to pass U.S. history, world history, government, economics, like it's content-related questions, psychology, world history. And um, I passed a test, right, yeah. that the state gave. It's practice, praxis exam, um, praxis one and praxis two. Passed them both, got great scores. And so when people, when, you know, people that want to hire me look at those scores, they say, wow, look at this lady. She knows her history. Sure. The question I now ask thinking about this is, well, whose history do I know? Oh, right. Yeah. So here I am. I'm being tasked with educating people, not only about women, but about minorities, right. about indigenous people, about poor people, disabled people. And I don't know any of their history. And the, the burden of learning that history is on me, not on the 
the system that educated me. Right. And that's pretty crazy to think about. Well, and then you're supposed to halt, stop what you're doing, go quick read and educate yourself on all of those topics you just mentioned, just so that you can then make sure that you're getting the kids in your classroom a better shot. Yeah. I'm supposed to, for somehow, I am supposed to be the stopgate for white male centrism. (laughs) Yes, you alone, Kelsey. You know? But, like, (laughs) seriously, and sometimes it feels like that. It does. And And it's not surprising that it would feel that way because of exactly what you mentioned. It's, you know, you're put at the center of a really hard place to be. Right. And it would be real easy just to lean back and coast and teach what, you know, kind of is already in front of you versus trying to present some diversity. Right. But I think this just goes to show how hard it is to teach, to get women's history into our experience and our collective knowledge. And and so it is really heavily reliant on you to do the work. Yeah. And to seek out professional development and all those things. And social studies teachers as a field, and I don't know what causes this. It could be a whole plethora of, of reasons. But social studies educators tend to be the least likely of all the subjects to seek out professional development. Interesting. (laughs) I don't know why that is. All right, Brooke. So I think I've illustrated how my own education really set me up for failure with teaching women's history in school. Yes. And the pressure that I feel to be the stopgate. Failed you. Failed you. They have failed me. And I think and I think to be to be honest, I probably have failed my students. I know I have failed my students. There are things that I taught you know, my first or second year, that they're not wrong. Like, I'm not lying to my students, but it's it's white male-centric. And, I'm, well, and my whole experience... Well, you didn't know what you didn't know. Right. Now you know. Yeah. I, I mean, I could bust into a big Eve Small song right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now you know. Yeah. So bring it forward. So you bring it forward. All right. Well, we're going to take a little break. Okay. And we'll be right back. For lesson plan ideas and how to teach women's history, visit our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Remedial Herstory. If you think what we're doing is needed, please consider joining our Patreon community. Patreon allows you to sponsor a podcast with a small donation. Patrons get access to bonus materials, extended episodes, insider information, and gear. Give at whatever level you can, Patrons who give at the $25 tier will receive a Remedial Herstory mug and a booklet of all the Remedial Herstory lesson plans and resources. This episode is sponsored by our patrons. Thank you to Kent and Jamie Heckel from Ohio, Sarah Reardon from New Hampshire, Leah Tanger from Connecticut, and Bridget Erlinson from Connecticut. You guys make this show possible. Brooke, you ready to talk about nuns? Yes, very, very ready for the nunning. For the nunning. (laughs) Bring on the nuns. Bring on the nuns. Okay. So I picked nuns to go with the with talking about my own education because I think that nuns are a really cool example of women being educated. Um, All right. Yeah. Interesting approach. Right. And so it's it's kind of the exception to the rule that women were denied educations outside of the home. And um, it's the one place that women could get an education. Probably the best education was in, in at least in the West, was in a nunnery. Yeah. Or covenant. Okay. So. And they get to hang out with all women and protection of the church. Yeah. I mean, it's not a bad gig. It's a pretty good gig. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about the hats, but... (laughs) By the 1300s, (laughs) Philip of Navarre argued, one should not teach a woman letters or writing unless she is a nun, because a woman's reading and writing leads to great evil. Who's that dope? Yeah, he was a ruler, a king. (laughs) 
We'll let him have it. Might be. Might be. <laughs> but I think it shows the, this was, that was in 1300. So it sort of shows what was very common, um, this perception that women's education is, right, knowledge tree of evil. This is not a good idea for okay. women to do that. Um, and yet he makes this big exception, except in the nunnery, right? Like, thank you for making an exception. Yeah. So inside covenants and, and nunneries, and I learned recently the difference. Oh, there's a difference? Yeah. So a covenant is a begging community. So the people that live in a covenant are, they're in t- they're, they sustain themselves only by the generosity of other people that give to the covenant, whereas oh. a nunnery might have other means of income. Okay. Um, so yeah, like that, which I thought that was an interesting distinction. Didn't know the difference. And are they, I mean, maybe we'll get into this, but does every religion have a, or is it mostly the Catholic church? Um, no, lots of different, I don't know if they would call it a covenant or a nunnery, but very similar things exist all around the world. Service to the, the church or to, to the the mosque. So, um, yeah. So I think this exists all around the world. Yeah. In different forms. As sort of like, yeah. And it's this big exception to, you can't educate women. And yet here women are being educated and here's some crazy data because I give it to me. I was like, got for data blown away by this. So inside covenants, women become scholars. They dedicate their lives to God, chastity, virginity. And because, um, in a lot of cases, you know, especially if they're coming in younger, they are not necessarily having children, which is one of like the leading causes of death for women was right. childbirth. Yeah, so right, they're living a lot longer, but they're also not doing all of the like labor and the demands of running a household. Right, right? they're spending a lot of time like reading and singing and praying and okay. knitting and and um, doing good work and doing charity. Right, so totally different lifestyle than the women who are probably just like domestic slaves outside of yeah. of the walls of the covenant. Where is our local covenant okay. <laughs> that we can join? <laughs> that sounds real relaxing right about now. Right. So nuns in the early period often lived between two and four times longer what? than their married female counterparts on the outside of the nunnery. Interesting. Isn't that wild? I mean, it makes sense. Makes yeah. I it's not hard to believe, I guess is what I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> So nunneries are super similar to the monasteries that men are, and, and they might even be combined under the same monastery um, that what's, men. What's the difference between a monastery? Yeah, so that's where the same, it's the, almost exactly the same, but it's for men. And so it's like m- the monks that are there are okay. have, have dedicated themselves to, you know, chastity and serving God and you know, Community. prayer and yep. charity works and all of those things. And in a lot of ways, they're basically the same. Um, they renounce all their worldly goods um, and they contribute a lot to religious literature, which at the time is like literature, right? right. <laughs> like that is what you know, you're contributing to. And we can trace um, nunneries pretty much back as far as we can chase uh, trace monasteries. And so around the fourth century, you see, and it's probably earlier, you see nunneries on the rise. And so, interesting, yeah. So it's sort of as the Roman empire is declining and nunneries are rising up, um, and, and providing this, this sanctuary really for, for women, but also an opportunity to serve and learn. Right. Um, and so that's, it's a totally different way because, you know, in film, it's like, don't send me to the nunnery. And in this way, it's like, no, I'm like, here's all of the empowerment. Are movies you're watching? But I do think there's a lot of, like, women being sent to the monasteries and, like, and being sent to these places um, as a punishment. And, you know, thinking back to those time periods that women might have been sent, you know, it does seem kind of like a sentencing yeah. Because of modern times. But now as we get to reflect and look back, it obviously looks a little different. Right. Right. 
So it's interesting that in the early nunneries, some of the like most famous, you know, people, men or women who have dedicated themselves to God, right, and to charitable works, um, some of the most prominent people from this time were actually women. And many of these women were, like, sainted because right. of their yeah. work. Um, St. Mary of Egypt um, comes to mind. She was a reformed prostitute. And okay. I, the word prostitute, I don't really even no, know what you're that... supposed to say sex worker. Okay. <laughs> but also it could just mean, like, not a virgin, you know? like Oh, yeah, back then we have no idea. But, yeah. Nowadays, it's a sex worker, and it's a choice. Right. <laughs> and, um, but she, anyway, she famously spent 17 years in the desert, and she, and, and, and then comes out of the desert, and, and um, a, a writer, and a thinker, and is Saint, she's St. Mary, you know? Okay. So, that, I think that's pretty cool. One interesting thing that I found is that um, men and women, where they were housed when they were doing God's work, um, were often kept far apart from each other. And one of the sources that I found said that um, at one abbey, they actually even passed a rule that said they couldn't be the, the where the men were housed and where the women were housed couldn't be within four miles of each other. <laughs> because here you have a bunch of people who've taken vows of chastity and they don't want to be tempted, right? So keep them four miles apart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that was pretty funny. Um, but there were some that famously like combined and I think that's kind served of served together. Served yeah. together. Yeah, I mean, they have the same missions, which is really cool. Um, one woman, Claire of Assisi, she was an aristocrat and a follower of St. Francis, and she establishes her own all-female um, community. Um, I, thought, I thought you were going to say band. <laughs> Get it. No. I mean, but they probably do have a band because they I all mean, sing together regularly, right? <laughs> Religious music. I was like, please make a band. <laughs> there were 24 of these all female covenants alone, which I thought was really um, in Italy alone. So, okay. all female, 24 of them. So, that's pretty, that's a lot of opportunities yeah. for women. Um, the church does not allow women to preach. And this is something that St. Paul is very adamant about. And in the Old Testament... Um, what century is St. Paul? So um, St. Paul is one of the early teachers, uh, mm -hmm. like Christian teachers. He is a follower of Christ, right? And he spreads a lot of the early um, Christian teaching. Oh. Okay. And so in... In the Bible, there are many references to his thoughts about the structure of the church and that type okay. of thing. Um, and so he makes he makes many references to, you know, this is women should not be preaching, women should not be doing this, um, and and so that is adhered to even in these nunneries. So the women who are in the nunneries have to confess to a male priest, just like everybody else. And so even. Um, even though there's sort of this like all female space, there's still a male head of that space, which I think is really interesting. Interesting or annoying, you decide. You decide. <laughs> yeah, good, good point. <laughs> um, a lot of women joined because of piety um, that that, you know, they wanted to be closer to God. They wanted to be in this environment. Mm -hmm. Um a lot of aristocratic women joined for those um, reasons. So when aristocratic women joined, they would give up all of their earthly goods. Like yes. Riches, gold, rings, households, land, and property. Yep. Especially if you don't find a good match or somebody that you're willing to marry. This is an, a, a good alternative. Um, and... A lot of these people, I mean, this is also like if you're an ambitious intellectual woman, this is probably your place to be. I mean, don't they have the best libraries <laughs> to get into and like yeah. best places to read and study? Yeah. So parents oftentimes sent their daughters there because it was like, here's the place that you can get the best education. Oftentimes, you know, it could also be that they have a ton of daughters and they need to you know, they can't, <laughs> they can't produce that many dowries for their daughters. And so, um, a lot of girls, you know, become like, they sort of just have to have, have a life in service. Yeah. Widowed women 
often have a lot to contribute, especially if they helped manage an estate after their husband passed away. Okay. And so those women have incredible expertise, and they often found themselves to be sort of the mother abbess of the nunnery because and of mother their, abbess is the head, the head, head, late, head <laughs> yeah. Uh, but she has that experience because. You know, because her spouse passed away, right. so she has something that a lot of the women living inside the nunnery didn't didn't get. Yeah, and have not seen or interacted with, so she can keep the place afloat, essentially. Yeah, totally. It doesn't appear that there's really any belief or any distinction between, oh. you know, the accomplishments of the women and accomplishments of the men. Are they even allowed to put their names on things Yeah, that they so do? women, I mean, like I said, some of them are the most prominent prominent writers and thinkers, especially in the early monasteries. And so um, I thought that was that was really powerful. They wrote um, d- small devotional books, um, compendiums of prayers, guides for religious contemplation, treaties on the meaning and relevance of visions experienced by some nuns, right? Like, Interesting. So they're writing about religious experience. Um, and I thought, th- like, that's pretty I profound. love how they're writing about it from the inside. And they're not being crucified as witches or other. Yeah, (laughs) totally. Oh, because you're close to God and you've given up your life for him. Uh, You're allowed to write and read and do all these things and make an impact on the world. But if you come outside those doors... And it will burn you at the stake. And yeah. it was kind of this weird exception because they've taken this vow that people yeah. on the outside are not willing to take, right? This vow to serve God, to give up all worldly things, to wear the simplest clothes, right? Yeah. And, um, and yeah, so it almost gives them this superpower because you can't argue they with are, God. Yeah, well, and even, I mean, it's a mission and a cause, and they're taking up the charge to do that, and it's... Dedicating your life to service. Women in the in the nunneries often did a lot more charitable work than the the men did in the monastery. That's so surprising, Kelsey. <laughs> that's just like that's a, a nice eye roll. <laughs> that's so bizarre. I would never have imagined that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the things they did was like giving out food, giving out clothing to the needy, caring for others, caring oh. for other people, looking after the sick. They were tutors to children, you know, those types yeah. of things. And um, they provided hospice service for the dying. A lot of the jobs that women today do, right? To just right. kind of traditional women's work. Um, so, and this is the other really interesting thing is that because they wanted to be where the people were, nuns were almost more visible than monks were because right. they needed to be where people were, right? And so they were often near cities, whereas monks were sometimes outside, um, you know, yeah. with, their, with their big libraries. Nuns who forgot the patriarchal power structure were definitely punished. Um, there was one nun who tried to build a school to educate young girls who hadn't com- committed to the covenant. Okay. And um, she was imprisoned in a windowless cell. Oh. Um, <laughs> Why? Two other women, um, two other nuns began preaching in the streets, which we learned already is... It's a no-no. That's a no-no. You don't preach. Um, and so... When a bystander asked them who their husband was, the women replied, they had no husband but Jesus Christ. (laughs) And the mayor dubbed them whores and instructed the constable to whip them in public square until blood ran down their backs. Oh, my. So. That's pretty aggressive. I mean, they're just trying to spread the good word. They're just trying to, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right, I mean, here they are. And, it, I mean, it reminds me of some women that we'll see later in history who try to preach, um, like Anne Hutchinson in mm. um, early colonial America. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's this definite, like, this is not your, not space. your space. Yeah, this like is not what you do. Stay out of my lane. One of the most prominent nuns is a woman named Hildegard of Bingen. She's basically like German, for lack of uh, uh, formalized, Germany. yeah, Germany. <laughs> um, for lack of Germany, she's she's, she's in that part of the world. <laughs> yeah, um, she's a Christian mystic, and I'm sorry, what? A, a mystic is just like a very like spiritual thinker, okay? So she's really interesting. Um, She refuses to be defined by the patriarchy, uh, and she's actually able to bypass it just by being a feisty lady. Um, 
How so, Kelsey? <laughs> well, <laughs> do tell. So, what's up with Miss Hildy? So she is. Um, she really believes that. One of the biggest things that she challenges is this idea that um, Earth is sort of our consequence for original sin. And she looks at the Earth and she sees how beautiful it is. And she sees divinity in everything and, and the greenness and the richness of the Earth. Okay. So... All of her writings are really challenging this idea that it's sort of like a punishment to be here, that we're in some sort of like... Purgatory. Yeah. And um, so she contributes a lot to idea like biology and the- and sort of like... Because remember, church, state, se- you know, yeah. scientific revolution hasn't really occurred yet. So, so a lot of her ideas are really about nature and sort of the interconnectedness of everything. She believes in um, divine wisdom, and she believes in a specifically eminent female divine wisdom. Oh, how dare she? Yeah. Um but people like her works, and so it's being widely read and um, like underground read or like like passed read out in read okay. like passed out in public. Yeah, and I think part of that is the prestige that comes from her service and devoutness. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, it's like this big exception. So she's popular in the German circles or lack of Germany. Yeah, <laughs> and um, so she has a lot of visions from a young age, and a lot of her writings are about her visions. And um, there are many people in history who have claimed to have have visions. visions. And so what was actually going on is unclear. We do know that she's ill. (laughs) Maybe. I mean, she's in the woods. She's touching mold. Let's just (laughs) be serious here. I think more likely um, she's ill a lot as a kid. And at some point later in life, she's bedridden for a portion. People think that it's Satan punishing her or God punishing her for being a little too forward with her feminist thinking. A.K.A. Scarlet Fever. (laughs) Yeah. It could have been a lot of things. Could have been seizures. Could have been, you know, I don't don't know. I'm speculating here. I'm not a doctor. But. You're not. um, I'm not. Fun fact. (laughs) So. Um. But she has visions, and she writes about a lot of her visions. And um, so she's considered incredibly wise. People from all over come to, to seek out her counsel. Oh, um, so, right. yeah, and, and, and even men, actually. Um, and she, you know, low-key preaches to men um, in closed settings, which, you know, That's, Paul said, don't do don't that. Don't do it. Paul yeah. said that, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> She was selected within her nunnery to um, be the abbess, to be the leader. And so she's in a position of power, which I think is also really interesting. Um, She eventually wants to create a new nunnery for women. And she asks the head priest if he would... Well, there's your first problem. You don't ask. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, step one, no. <laughs> step to, skip to step two. In 1147, she asks to leave her covenant and go 63 miles away, and um, the abbot is um, not okay with that. He doesn't want her to like so surprising. be out of his authority sight. and yeah. sight. So um, he wants her to take a different position. And I think a piece of this, though, is she also brings in a lot of money because yeah. she's such she's so well-respected within the community, and so people make donations after they've come to hear her. And so I think there's also this sort of, like, economic reason that he doesn't want her to yeah, go. Yeah, like, don't can't lose the moneymaker. Right. She requests again. He says no. And so she goes around him, and she asks the archbishop... And the archbishop gives her permission. Oh, and this snap. is when she falls ill, and they think like, "Oh, she, you know, the, the, this is her being punished because she has sort of overstepped, um, and she's bedridden. And she's stricken with quote paralysis, so severe that no one could move her arms or legs." So. What that means is really like I have many medical questions, and I wish a right. doctor had yeah. been there. Um, could it have been a little bit dramatic, perhaps, because once 
uh, she, the, you know, the authorities that be relent and allow her to go, it goes away. Oh, self-induced. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, girl's got a flair for drama. Just let it happen. Yeah. So she takes 18 nuns and establishes. 18. 18. They're out of here. They take her friend who will be their monk so All they can All I'm confess. imagining is like these badass nuns putting on sunglasses and leather jackets and riding hogs out of town. Life is a highway. <laughs> We're out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Right. So... I don't know if it's because of Protestantism coming in in the in the centuries that follow, (laughs) but there's a lot of like bashing of the nunneries, especially because it's such a like image of Catholicism. Yeah, right. There's also and and some people think that this might have been a lot of like Protestant propaganda to get people to like leave Catholicism and join the cause. But there's a lot of stuff about um, like rampant lesbianism going on in these nunneries. I wasn't gonna mention it, but I just feel like if I was a lesbian during that time period, where am I going? To all the ladies. To the nunnery, yes. <laughs> so to my fellow ladies. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's kind of an interesting piece of, and, and, and it totally, like, learning about this history really reshaped how I thought about the, the nunneries, right? This is, like, this yeah. sanctuary from the patriarchy to some extent. And um, at least it's like a, a dampening of its influence. And it's right. giving women this like outlet for scholarship and education. And um, safety and protection. Safety and protection. And they can educate each other. Like all the things that I mean, were disappointed. And have some lady love. Look yeah. Good for them. <laughs> but all the things we're disappointed we didn't learn about in you know, in our educations, these women can teach each other, right? Right. It's it's a women, woman driven education. So I'm going to have a lesson plan related to the nunneries. And, um, I think it's a cool thing to look at the impact of some of these people. I would love to sort of do a compare contrast of Protestant, you know, like conceptions of the nunneries versus you know, what these women had to say about the nunneries, or at least historians have to say about the nunneries right. themselves. So I'm going to have some an inquiry for people to dig into about, you know, how helpful were these nunneries and were they really, you know, um, this, this sanctuary for women um, or were they a distraction from divinity and a, a lesbian cult? Cult. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's cool too. I love this, though. So people can get this on the website. They'll be able to get it on the website. Awesome. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you, Brooke. I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. See you next time. See you next time. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.